product uh, in the introduction with uh, my call sign in Germany on it, the Delta Julia 5 Alpha November, taking place Germany uh, this morning. But now uh, we're ready for it, so we give the introduction to, uh, to Randy K5 Zulu Delta. Go ahead, Randy. Okay, good morning, I guess good afternoon for, to everyone. The sun just came up here about uh, 30 minutes ago, so I'm <laughs> still waking up a little bit. But uh, thank you for the invitation. <clears throat> I've done many presentations over the web before, but never uh, with video at the same time, so that this will be fun for me also. What I want to do, I've, we have two presentations here, but the first one, I just want to talk about the CQ Worldwide contest. I'm the director of the CQ Worldwide. I started last year after um, uh, replacing uh, Bob Cox K3 EST, who did the job for 30 something years. Uh, so I have a lot of work to try to keep up with what he's done already. I'm helped by a lot of different people. Uh, so there's a CQ Worldwide Committee, which is a, a contesters from all around the world. Uh, some of them help with the log checking and the log processing. Other ones are serving as advisory uh, committee members or um, as ambassadors out into the world. So one of the, uh, uh, we have a member from the Netherlands, PA3 AAV. Uh, so he, uh, so if you have any feedback on the contest, uh, if you tell him, he knows how to uh, submit it into the group. Uh, he is present here, there, Randy. So. Uh... You might ask him to stand up so uh, you can see him live around here. Ja, Gerda, wil je eens even opstaan, alsjeblieft? I'm not sure if we've ever met before, so nice to meet you. No, that's, uh, so these guys, th this job would be impossible without the, all of these people helping out and giving their advice. As you can see, the CQ Worldwide Contest has a long history. And it's been growing uh, based on the number of logs submitted every year. Uh, last year, we had over 15,000 logs submitted between uh, the two modes. Sideband is always a little more than CW, but uh, CW is still very strong. And uh, so my job as the new director is just to uh, not mess anything up. If we can continue on this uh, path, uh, we're doing very well. I think what this shows is that contesting is a very popular uh, thing for new hands or in the hobby today. Uh, people really like the idea of competition. And in the worldwide, of course, this contest has the most DX of any contest. So it, it's, it's almost a, a contest you have to operate every year. This is a graphic <laughs> that was produced um, last year by ZL2HAM. He took the results from 2012 and plotted them uh, by the location of all the participants. And a big circle means there were more participants from that one area or that, that one place. And so you can see very clearly what you already know, which is most of the contest activity is in Europe or in uh, North America and the United States, also a lot in Japan. But what I like about this picture is that you can see the CQ Worldwide contest is truly international. There are small dots everywhere, in Africa, Indonesia, Australia, in Asia, in South America, all these islands in the Pacific. And this is really what makes the contest uh, so exciting because there really are people on from everywhere in the world. Here's the same picture for CW, and you notice it looks very similar. Uh, it's, the, it's the same activity, but also the same uh, mix of dots all in all different parts of the world. When, um, when I was talking to CQ Magazine last summer, uh, I made a comment to them that one of the things that I was the director of the CQWPX contest before, and the most requested thing from the participants was, could we produce the results uh, more quickly? Uh, you do the contest, and then we see some email traffic about the contest with the results. 
and then you have to wait almost a year to see the final scores. And people were asking, why is this taking so long? <coughs> Uh, so a big part of the reason was the magazine publishing schedule. CQ had decided that, or had in their editorial calendar every year, the results of the CQ Worldwide would be in um, August and September. And uh, so I suggested that we needed to, to do this sooner. We, and they agreed. So CQ Magazine completely redesigned their editorial calendar to have the results be much sooner. So we saw that in this year, um, the results came out in April for a sideband instead of in August. But part of the way we can do that is we need the logs in five days. So last year was the first year where the log deadline was five days. And it uh, caught some people by surprise, but I wanted to mention it because it's very important when you finish the contest, don't wait too long. Just um, package up your log file and uh, submit it right away so you don't forget. If we receive a log after the five days, we still include it in the scores. It will still show up in the results, but it is not eligible for any awards <coughs> or certificates. Another uh, few things I wanted you to be aware of uh, that's part of the log checking process. In the past, the CQ Worldwide contest would accept the QSO if it was in both logs on the same band. The time did not matter. And so we were seeing cases where a QSO would be in one log on the first day and it would be in the other log on the second day. And it's impossible with that to tell if that QSO actually happened or not. So we made a change in the log checking this year that contacts must match within a 30-minute time window. So in other words, for a contact account, it must be in both logs at the same time. This seems very simple, but you would be surprised how many people have trouble with keeping time in their log. Uh, but the important thing out of this is not only to keep your log accurately for time, but also to log every QSO that you make, including the duplicates. So let's say that you think you worked the station on the first day, but they did not put you in the log. Then uh, you work in the second day. Well, if you work in the second day, and now it's in both logs, now you'll get credit for it. And they'll have a penalty for that missing QSO that they uh, made before. So go ahead and log all the duplicates. They don't cost anything, and they can only help your score. Uh, the other thing that we're doing in the CQ Worldwide is we're now checking the zones that are copied in the uh, logs. Uh, they didn't used to do this. And um, it's a very simple thing here. Everyone knows the zones of the stations that they're working, so it should not be a big um, challenge here. But we're just saying it's another part of the competition is to copy the exchange and type it correctly in the log. Uh, and then the last one is just an administrative thing. If we receive a log where all of the QSOs are on one band, we are converting the, and, and we're making that a single band uh, entry. Uh, it's not a big thing. Most people get it right. But some people, uh, I think um, uh, some new software users, sometimes they don't know that they have to select a single band entry and they make all their contacts on one band. So we're fixing that for them. Shouldn't be a too much of an issue. So now I want to talk about some tools that we've made available over this past year. And the first one is the CQ Worldwide website. It's very easy to remember, cqww.com. And on the website, you can um, find the rules in multiple languages. So uh, we have uh, German, well, obviously English, German, French, Japanese, Spanish, Chinese, uh, some other ones. Um, the idea is to try to, with so many people around the world participating in the contest, we want to make it easy for everyone. Uh, there's also some frequently asked questions, uh, some explanations of the rules. So if you don't understand something or you want to know more, uh, you can learn there. We've created an online score database. And right now we have all of the, every 
a log that's been submitted in the last 21 years typed in to the SCORE database, and we're continuing. We're going to go all the way back to the beginning. Uh, you can also find all of the CQ Worldwide results for all time uh, there. So let me just uh, change. So here's the CQ Worldwide website, and under the results tab, you can see the, write, uh, the PDF files of the write-ups for each year. And if you go all the way to the bottom, here's the same thing going back in time. It's very fun to go back and look at the results in the 1960s or earlier and see how much ham radio has changed uh, for the equipment and the scores <laughs> um, over, the, over this time period. But you'll also notice how much things have stayed the same. It's still all the same complaints about too much QRM, bad condition, <laughs> Uh, that kind of thing. <coughs> now, while you're here, if you wanted to see how you um, had done in a contest, I already typed in in your once, but if you type in your call sign, we'll show you every score that you have made um, in the contest that your call has been associated with. So on sideband, all PA5 PT, but on CW, he was an operator at the multi op station, so we show that as well. I find as I operate more and more contests, I can't remember one from the next. So it's very helpful sometimes to just come look and see what was I doing or where did I operate in 2004 or something like that. And then if you want to, um, you can you can drill in and you can actually see all the scores from from uh, 2004, for example. So another tool that we've created to help with the log submission is, uh, we call it the log check tool. So under the logs tab, there's a, a menu item called log check. And it's a web page where you can select a contest and then upload your log file. And when you do that, we will check the log file and make sure that it has all of the information that we're looking for and everything is in the correct format. So you can see in this, in this file there are two, two lines that have an error. And then we show you your log file. So all you have to do right here on the page is correct the errors, submit the file again by clicking the process button. And when everything is correct, the um, web page will ask you for your email address and then it will send your log into the robot. You can still send your log in by email if you want, but this method, right in one place, you can make sure that you have everything correct and then submit your log um, and then you don't, you'll get the acknowledgement email back from the robot to the address that you enter and you're done. And question, so I might, I might a question about this. Um, that you try this uh, when you submit your log. Uh, may we have a question about this, uh, Randy? Sure. Uh, does the log also be sent uh, as a return to that uh, email address? Because otherwise I might make some changes which are not in the log I, uh, I, put, I, load, I uploaded. Yes, there's a checkbox. So right next to where you would enter your email address, and this may be hard for you to see on the screen, but right next to where you enter your email, there's a checkbox that says, send a copy of log file. And if you check that box, it will also send you your log by email. Okay, so thank you. It both to the robot and to you. That way you, because yes, you want to have the final one that you submitted. Okay? Yeah, okay, Bobby. Anyone else has questions? Can we use that website for the PACC? Yes, well, feel free to ask as we go along, otherwise I'll just keep going. Uh, <laughs> you know, uh, Steve has a personal question for, for you, but I'll let him ask that later. He said he wanted to use that for the PACC contest, too. <laughs> oh, okay, well, I, uh, I can... Uh, this was written for me by Lima Zulu 2 Foxtrot Quebec. And uh, he's a very good guy, and uh, I'm sure if you contact him, he can uh, be happy to talk about it. Okay, thank you. So I talked a little bit earlier about the online score database and having all of the scores of the contest uh, in one place. It really is um, uh, 
uh, fun to um, you know have all the scores. Let's say we were going to operate the CW contest, and I was going to operate from the Netherlands. So I come down to PA, and um, we won't select any category. <clears throat> so at this point, I get a list of every score that's ever been submitted from the Netherlands uh, in the CQ Worldwide CW contest, and they're ordered by score. Well, I'm, not, I'm only interested in single operator scores. <clears throat> so now we're looking at the single operator. So we can see PA3 AAV has uh, many of the top ones. <laughs> um, if we select the band breakdown, we can see. So you, <clears throat> in the past, all of the band breakdowns in CQ Magazine were only the top five or top six stations uh, in the whole world. Now um, we give the band breakdowns for every station that enters the contest. So now you can come back and use this, uh, you know, as you're trying to plan your contest efforts or look ahead. Another thing that I like to do is as I'm operating the contest, I will, as I see my score on the computer screen, I'll keep seeing who the next person is in the list. So maybe I'll get to um, hey, your JR score, your 432,000, and then I'll see, well, can I go across the next score? Can I go across the next score? Can I go across the next score? Can I go my way up the, the list? So it's just a fun way to uh, see, you know, can you make a score that's in the top 50 or top 10 or something uh, for your country? Uh, and you can also do the same thing uh, for zones or by continent and so on. A lot of happy faces here. Uh, they see a challenge, uh, Randy. Now, why is that? Well, they can challenge their cell by the next hire. Uh, That's yeah. what you explained. Uh, a lot of happy it, faces here. Yeah, it's great. It's great fun. And, and you know, sometimes sometimes it gets um, you know get into the second day. You're looking for anything to keep your mind uh, occupied. <laughs> Another thing that we've done is we're using the score database to generate all the records now. So this is why we need to keep typing further back in time. But for the last 21 years, all of the uh, the all-time records are here. This may be easier if we just look at it on the uh, web page. So we can see, oops, this is for the world, but if we want to see what the records are for PA, we select the Netherlands, and now we can see here are the all-time record score, at least the uh, last 21 years, all-time record scores for uh, for the Netherlands um, for each category. And we can see, for example, on uh, for sideband, um, you know, the multi-single record is more than 10 years old. We can see it's almost 20 years for the 10-meter uh, single band <laughs> record. Um, so here's another thing for you to pick. And when you get down to some of the new categories, like single off or assisted QRP, uh, we've had no entries. So if you want to get your call sign in the record books. Okay, okay guys, you know what's the challenge now? <laughs> but it is QRP, so uh, think carefully before you. There may be a reason there are no entries in that category. Actually, we're, we're missing the, oh, yeah, here's the single off QRP. So there have been some QRP entries, but for example, none on 160 meter phone, that kind of thing. The guy with the QRP records uh, down there he is in the, in the room here, uh, Randy, so he's looking very big and pleased uh, with a big <laughs> smile on his face. Uh, all right, well, that's what, uh, you know, um, it's interesting when you look at the scores. Of course, they keep getting higher as the activity gets more each year, but still, um, it's just, you know, there's all these special years where the conditions were just perfect on one band or where uh, you, the right operator and the right station and the right conditions all got together. So uh, that's why I like having all these records. If I work on the database, I like having all these records. It just makes it more fun. <coughs> um, we already talked about, uh, well, actually, uh, one more thing more here. Another type of record, not just by score, but also who are the winners for all years? So we'll come down to the Netherlands again. So here is the winning single operator high band score for every year for the Netherlands. So we can see AGA was very good, and then IJM, and now AAV, and now uh, ECQT won uh, the single op last year on CW. So this is just another interesting way to look at the history. Uh, maybe we want to find um, QRP all band. 
So here's the single operator QRP all band winner each year. So you can see that the scores get a little higher and then uh, lower. It follows the sunspot cycle. Uh, but let's see how many. So someone on QRP sideband doesn't make very many contacts, but uh, 10 meters is good for QRP. That's what we see there. <laughs> So anyway, I hope you take advantage of the tools on the website and, and please um, you know, look at the rules. One of the things that we did earlier this year was we ran a survey. So everyone who had submitted the log in last year's contest, we sent an email inviting them to um, take the survey and then we also announced it publicly. So we ended up with about 4,800 surveys. This is after we took all the duplicates out. So we know there's a, probably five to 10,000, you know, or at least 5,000 serious contestors out there. And it was very interesting, the results. I'm not going to show all of them here, but um, what we see is we got the most um, responses from Europe. And right now, Europe is the most active part of the world for radio contesting, for any contest, not just the CQ contest, but all of them. Uh, it's really fantastic how ham radio and activity is growing in Europe. Uh, USA is second, then we have uh, Asia and so on. We asked people who filled out the survey to say um, what their uh, activity level was. Are they serious trying to win or are they just part-time looking for awards, that kind of thing. And we see that most of the people who responded, of course, said they were trying to win something or win an award. So we feel like, okay, the survey gave us a good idea of what the serious players in the contest are all about. I wanted to share this slide because it's also very interesting to me, which is that uh, when we look at the ages, we see that uh, Europe is younger than uh, the typical responses in the USA. And I think this probably helps explain why activity in Europe is so much more. But what should worry all of us as contesters is that these, this curve is very high in the numbers, uh, in the ages. So we are not seeing very many people down in the bottom in the 15 to 30 year range. Uh, when I first received my ham radio license, I was 13 years old and there were many others, uh, many of the top contesters you know today were all about the same age. So um, we have some need to keep looking for young people as we go forward. So every chance you get to encourage someone, please do so. Uh, we, we do our best there, uh, Randy, but uh, I think uh, yeah, the United States have a, a bigger challenge because the people are a lot of older. So you have to get some more youngsters in on the radio, yeah. aren't you? Or you, won't, you won't have anyone to work. <laughs> the, uh, it's, I have to say this, if, if, I, if computers had come along um, you know, when I was 13, I probably would have never discovered radio. So this is our challenge as we're fighting against uh, all the other interesting tools and technology out there. Um, I talked about the five-day deadline. It was new last year, so we wanted to ask people their opinion about it. And most people were okay with it. I, you know, it, it, uh, it's not, it should not be such a big problem when the contest is over, especially using a computer to... Um, quickly be able to send the log in. Some people felt it wasn't enough time. Uh, you know, part of the reason we also made the deadline much shorter was there were people who were um, cleaning their log, so to speak. They, we would call it log washing. They would finish the contest and then they would spend time with QRZ.com or the cluster or talking to their friends and correct call signs in their log and so on. Thank you, sir. And it's our belief that a contest should be recording what you do on the air, and then you no, send it in. No, it's okay to make mistakes. Mistakes are part of the game. If you make mistakes, then you can learn from them and get better. Uh, but uh, we want the contest to be on the air, not how good you are at, um, at cleaning your log afterwards. So that's why we also why we made the log shorter. And most people were able to meet the deadline in the first year. We expect it to even be better this year. There was one um, other very controversial question, at least it was controversial here in the United States. We asked the question, 
should single operator and single operator assisted be combined? Because today we have two categories, one for people who, you, who only operate um, by themselves and, and another category for people who use the DX cluster. And I think we all know in the last 10 or 15 years, everyone is using the DX cluster for their DXing activities. And so uh, they often don't understand why we have two categories in the contest. And you can see here a little bit of the challenge. In Europe, there's more, it's, it's pretty even, but maybe more people favor that why do we have two? Let's just make one category. Whereas in the US, you can see there's quite a bit of difference. And uh, so we still are keeping the two categories for this year. There's no changes, but this is something that we have to think about as we go forward. Is that in the United States also produced by the H, uh, by the average high H in the United States? Yes, I can make a comment here that, you know, it's very difficult to get old people to want to change. <laughs> but yes, I think that um, there's research that shows, you know, uh, and you see this all the time, everyone wants it to be like when they were 20 or 25 years old. So. As you look back, you think, well, it was so much better uh, back then. I actually look at contesting today and think it's more exciting than it's ever been. We have more stations. We have better equipment. We're making incredible numbers of USOs. The operating skills are very high. Uh, so this is really a great time for contesting. But there are people who, who want it to be like it used to be. And uh, that's, that's OK. That's the way people are. Uh, is this, this questions are they also related to uh, the amount of QSOs that one makes in uh, in the contest, uh, Randy, or is it just by the number of people who joined it? Uh, these numbers are just by the number of people who responded. We did we did some breakdowns by different things just to see, but uh, it didn't really for these kind of questions. It didn't really matter. Uh, the answers were the same for serious and not serious people. So one question that was very interesting is we asked it. To me, as the director, after every contest, I receive emails from people complaining about spam plans or complaining about splatter or complaining about one thing or another. Um, but splatter to me or wide signals is one of the biggest problems that we have uh, because it, it ruins the contest for other people. Uh, it also makes us just sound like poor neighbors. So I asked the question, um, should we disqualify stations if they have for poor, poor signal quality? No definition of that word, but just what is poor signals? Could be splatter, could be something else. Could be key clicks. And you can see there was quite a bit of uh, support for such a thing. So we did add a rule <clears throat> uh, this year that uh, poor signal quality is considered unsportsmanlike conduct. We are working on some technical definitions of poor signals, but uh, I think the key thing here is we are seeing a lot of Russian or Eastern European stations that um, were starting to use very wide signals as an a offense or defensive technique, a way to keep a clear frequency, and we need some way to uh, remind them that that's not acceptable. Uh, Randy, this is uh, PA5X. Um, I can't hear you. Okay. Um, uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. okay, now you can hear me, I think. Uh, this is PF, uh, PF5X ML. Uh, what about stations with poor receivers? Do you disqualify them too? <laughs> <laughs> they actually, their score is affected uh, without us doing anything. <laughs> yeah, but I can imagine that some of the complaints come from people with poor receivers. Yeah, well, this is why we have to define a technical standard for this, uh, because you're right, if someone turns their noise blinker on, they may think the signal is bad when it's not. But we have another tool. I didn't include a slide here, but we are recording the entire contest on all bands uh, from multiple places in the world. So we have uh, stations using software-defined receivers in Europe, uh, North America, New Zealand, um, Asia. And we get those recordings after the contest. So if someone complains to us about a problem on the air, we actually have a way to go listen to exactly what was happening. Maybe the recording isn't always perfect or the propagation isn't always perfect, but we can usually tell what is happening. 
So uh, I don't think you're going to see that we're going to disqualify huge numbers of people for this, but we did and want the ability to have the conversation with some of these stations which do it year after year after year. So just to talk very quickly about some of these rules changes, um, there was no changing in the scoring or the category, so everything's the same as you know. We did remove the team competition. Um, this was a category where teams could register a five people and have a score as a team. It wasn't very popular. Uh, we want to focus on the club competition instead. The extreme category, we, this category was just very uh, unusual. It was kind of like a category for uh, stations which did not follow any of the rules. So we may come back and work on this some more, but the idea was to give people a place to experiment with new technology. And then the yellow and red cards for disqualification. This was too confusing. <coughs> now we just have disqualification. So there's no, uh, not two different colors. The biggest change in the rules is, a, is something called an overlay category. We had these in CQWPX for many years, but now we're adding it to the CQ Worldwide. There will be two of these overlay categories. The first one is the rookie category. I don't know if this word translates very well, but a rookie is someone who's a new, who is new to something. So the rookie ca um, category is for operators who are licensed for less than three years. <clears throat> so this is a category for new hands. So you can be very old, but if you only have a license for two years, then you can enter in this overlay category. Uh, Randy, why is that not changed to uh, uh, joining? the CQ Worldwide contest for uh, uh, at least three years. I did, well, I, it happened to me this morning. I got, got someone with me in the I took someone with me in the car, and uh, we've been talking about it. I said the word DXCC, and he'd been 25 years of him, and he said, what's that? So uh, the thing rookie doesn't always show that you all will have to be uh, active on, on the HF bands. Uh. No, that, <clears throat> that's true, that's a very good, uh, question. Uh, I think it was mostly, well, two reasons. One, we really were trying to find these people who are new in AM radio. Remember our curve from before. <laughs> we want to find the new guys. Also, it's just a, it's a administrative um, task. It's a little bit easier to identify when people receive their license as opposed to, uh, I mean, when they participated in the CQ Worldwide. Because remember, someone could have operated in the Worldwide many years without sending in a log. So, mostly just to make it easy for us. And it's an experiment. And it's been very popular. Um, so uh, we decided to try it in the Worldwide. The more interesting one, uh, for many of you, may be the classic overlay category. In the survey that we did, there were many people who said, can we have a 24-hour category? Or, I am i don't want to compete with the SO2R stations, uh, that kind of thing. So we said, okay, well, let's make a category that's like ham radio used to be. Uh, one operator, single operator only, one radio, no DX cluster, and a maximum of 24 hours of operation. And one other thing I should have done on the slide, 24 hours. This is 24 hours of operating time. Uh, so we do not include breaks. So if a break, if you make no contacts for 60 minutes, then that counts as a break. So you just you can start the contest at 8 o'clock at, at 0800. You can operate for eight hours, then you can take five hours off, and you can come back and operate for one hour, and then take some more time off. We're, we're going to count your first 24 hours of operation. You consider that good for, for the old bands. Uh, but some, some remarks came over here that uh, it uh, should be that also sending in the handwritten logs, uh, isn't it? <laughs> no, no, no. no. <laughs> With 7,000 or 8,000 logs, we, we only get about um, less, we get 80, less than 80 logs um, in handwritten or hand typed anymore. And we're typing them in 
Oh, please use the computer. But the uh, but the idea here is that you can your classic score is your first 24 hours of operation, but you can keep operating if you want. If the bands are really good, just keep going. In the end, you're going to receive two scores in the results. You'll have your traditional score calculated the normal way by however many contacts you make over the oper over the contest. And then you'll have a second score in the overlay category. So there'll be a separate results for the overlay categories, which will have your score limited at the 24-hour uh, mark. So uh, the idea here was we wanted to give people a place to compete with other stations that were doing the same thing they were, and yet still keep the traditional scoring uh, model in the contest. So it's kind of like entering two contests at the same time. And all you have to do is if you qualify for either of these overlays, is just make sure you add the proper line to your uh, Cabrillo header, uh, log file header. Category uh, overlay rookie or category overlay classic. Uh, Randy, I, yeah. I read before that when somebody is sending in the single band log, uh, but classifying it for L band, uh, you change it over to single band. But now the classic is only for all band, isn't it? <laughs> oh, that's a good question. I hadn't really thought about that. <laughs> so we'll, um, we'll have to look at that. The only reason we made it single operator all band was just to, this is kind of an experiment this first year. In WPX we also did the single bands and it caused an explosion in the number of certificates that they were <laughs> so First we want to see if this really works and then we'll decide yep, if we like add assisted next year and add single bands and so on. But good yep. question, I'll have to think about that. Just send electronic certificates for these ones. Yeah, yeah actually I didn't talk about that on the... Um, <laughs> one of the things that... <clears throat> one of the things that we've done... Let's see here, let's find... Uh, We'll go back to P85 and again. Oh, yeah, no, what? he didn't operate last year. Oh, here's one. Okay, so one of the things we've added to the website is everyone who enters the contest. Let's go all years, PA. Okay, so here's everyone who entered the worldwide sideband last year from uh, from the Netherlands. And we can see everyone has a certificate link out here, except PA0AA, their log was a little bit late. But um, let's say for PI4, let's see, PI4 EME. If we click the certificate link, it offers us the, um, the chance to create a uh, PDF file of their certificate. So now everyone who enters the contest, as soon as this finishes up, uploading your lab. Yeah, take some time. <laughs> I think I clicked on it too soon. Yeah. No, I don't know. Expected to get a PDF file open there. Uh, it'll probably open in two minutes from now or something. <laughs> anyway, um, the key thing here was just that you have the ability to everyone who enters the contest, even down to the very last score, um, can get a certificate for their uh, for their effort in the contest, or at least a PDF file if they want. Okay, there was one other change. Maybe it's not such a big deal in the Netherlands where the whole country fits inside of this uh, circle, but we now have two separate categories, one for USA clubs and one for international or DX clubs. And the rule, there it is, I knew it. It was only a matter of time. <laughs> so here's, the, here's the PI4 EME uh, PDF file certificate. So call all the operators. It shows what your placement was in your country and also what your placement was in the, in the continent or in the world. So uh, this is nice. You can send this to all of your operators and they can, uh, they can print it out or keep it in their filing cabinet. There we go. We had two of them. Okay, so the club competition, uh, 
one of the things that we were, in the U.S., everyone understands the idea of a club is um, people who live in a certain area, a certain place. Um, in the rest of the world, um, people are much more spread out, especially in places like Australia or Argentina or Brazil or whatever. So now the rules say all the entries can be from the same country plus anything within a circle. So for the Bavarian Contest Club with their headquarters in Munich, they can have entry people from all over Germany plus anyone inside of this circle. And the whole reason we focus on distance is um, just to keep it from being a game of how many um, people a club can recruit over the internet. So we want the competition to be somewhat among, um, you know, the, the oh, I lost my, uh, oops, I lost my video here. Um, so we just want the competition to be somewhat equal, so everybody is competing more or less on the same basis. In uh, the Netherlands, um, I noticed that the different uh, regional uh, clubs have been sending in um, some entries, which is great. Just uh, the only other thing, the big thing we changed, we talked about white signals already. The other thing that we changed is log checking penalties. In the CQ Worldwide, for many, many years, if you made a mistake in a call sign, you would lose that contact, plus you would lose three times more. So making a call sign error actually cost you four, you know, the same points as losing four contacts. And uh, this seemed a little high, so we changed it down to just plus two times. The reason this is here at all, why do we have any penalties? It's because we don't want people to guess. A big part of the contest is to make sure that you have the call sign correct. The, and also to make sure that you are in the other station's log. I realize that's sometimes not always easy to know, but get the call sign correct. Make sure that it's a two-way QSO, and you don't have to worry about um, any penalties at all. Also, for duplicates or making a mistake in the zone number, we just you just lose that one contact. There's no extra penalty or anything. And for duplicate contacts, they're duplicates, so there was no score for it. That doesn't cost anything. So please log all the duplicates. So I'll just finish up by you know reminding you um, to use the website to get um, familiar with the contest and and uh, look at the results from the past. Most importantly, get on the air for the contest. Work lots of DX, have fun. That's what this is all about, having fun. Uh, I think people spend too much time uh, worrying about winning when really there is nothing better than getting on the radio in the fall and um, working 100 countries in a weekend and being able to go tell your coworkers at the office that you talk to people in 130 countries over the weekend. Uh, so have fun and uh, please submit your log. It's, uh, it's, it helps us check the log and it also makes sure that you're in the database and you can have online certificates and so on. Uh, so uh, there's a lot, of, a lot of benefit that comes from just taking the few moments it takes to uh, submit your log. So with that, are there any questions? Okay, we got a couple of questions. I get the microphone here in the room. Hi. Hi, Ken. Uh, name is Frank, PA1 NHF. And on the last contest, there were lots of uh, few stations, but are using record calling. They calling CQ on the record, so to keep all the frequency occupied, and they are never coming back. So, is uh, CQ looking in that matter too? Old? So there's nothing in the rules. So there's nothing in the rules about uh, against that. I, it's just uh, just like we're using memory tiers on CW. People are using recorded audio on sideband, and I know it sounds like they're just CQing forever and ever and ever. Uh, and sometimes it seems that's true. That's what, but uh, it's part of the strategy in the contest is to have us especially the multi-operator, multi-transmitter stations to have a signal on the band all the time. It's a little bit like going fishing. Uh, if you want to, you can wait for the fish to, you know, you can go, um, it's very hard to catch fish if you don't have the line in the water. And calling CQ in a contest is very much like that. You're calling CQ and you don't know whether you're going to get um, 
a DL station or whether you're going to get some rare, um, you know, A5 station to call you, that kind of thing. So that's why you hear a lot of CQing these days because uh, people are doing it, you know, they understand that part of the game is you have to call CQ to get these rare guys who maybe don't work very many people to, uh, to get them in your log. I can see it up, but uh, I called them and they never came back. So they just keep the frequency occupied. That was the for for an hour or more or, even. Or they fell asleep. Mm -hmm. Well, I have to confess that more than once I've had my repeat set and then I uh, fell asleep or walked away. So it's not impossible to be doing that. But if you think someone is doing that uh, very uh, deliberately or or you think there's something wrong, then send me an email after the contest and tell me the call sign and the time, and we'll ask them about it. Okay, thanks for that answer there, Randy. I got a, another question. Okay, and this is PA180, one of the QP operators. Uh, what my uh, policy is, uh, what do you do with all the stations who are working in bad segments what are contest free? Uh, especially uh, when you ask them to go somewhere else, but they don't. We don't know anything about contest free segments. We have them. Well, actually, the CQ Worldwide rules do not specify contest free segments. So I now it is true there are band plans in different regions, and so in the CQ Worldwide rules, this is something we added in this year was we asked people to follow the band plans for their region. But as we all know, in a contest where there's this much activity, uh, you need the flexibility to allow the activity to expand. And uh, so it puts a lot of pressure on the band, puts a lot of pressure on the band plans. Uh, but right now, all we can do is ask people to, to follow the band plans, it's not part of the rules. And really from, for the CQ committee, we don't want to be in the business of trying to um, regulate this or um, you know, try to uh, find all the stations that make QSOs out of the, in the wrong place. Maybe not the best answer that you were looking for, but that's the reality where we are now. Uh, the reality is, of course, that not everybody even knows his own band plan. If you could look at the uh, IARU region 1 band plan, and some people still have something old in mind. Uh, how many times do I got scooped away from 14 to uh, 230, and people say, hey, this is only for slow scan television. <laughs> While the, the band plan saves me, it's a, a center of SSB contest activity. So, uh, yeah, th this is something which is discussable. Yeah, SSTV is an interesting one because I don't think it says that they're the only people who can use it. It's just that it's where they they are center of activity. I, to me, the worst problem is 40 meter sideband, right? Because the uh, USA multi ops are listening down all the way to almost to the bottom of the band. I don't necessarily agree with that practice, but uh, the reason they do it is because the Europeans will call them there. Yeah. Yeah. So it, it, it works both ways. Okay, thank you for that answer. Another one. Hello, uh, Papa Alpha through Sharon. Um, is there any chance that in the near future uh, some major contenders and big stations are monitored 48 hours? I mean, uh, there must be a possibility if it's possible for you to have a presentation through the internet uh, now. Then maybe with some uh, equipment there is a possibility to monitor big stations uh, 20, 40, 48 hours. Um, you mean monitor for that they're following the rules? Yes. yes. Like have a referee? Yeah, like a, like a referee. Yeah, we have a provision in the rules that where we can request the station to allow an on-site referee to visit and be there during the contest. Um, it's very difficult though because the kind of people we would use as the referee our contesters, and they really like operating the contest. <laughs> so, uh, it, but I wish we didn't have to talk about or think about these kind of things, but yes, uh, I think there are some cases where we may 
decide that we do need to put someone there just to try to understand what what's really going on. I think we have also a little mistake here in the, in the room. Uh, on your picture on the screen, it says Ken. It says what? Ken Clarbaut. That's what your name says on on your well, on, yeah. underneath your picture. <laughs> we all, uh, some of us know it's Randy, but uh, yeah. some of us who came in later didn't know or recognize that too well. Oh, actually, you know what? I'm very glad you asked about that because the go to meeting service that we're using here is a paid subscription service. And we are using the GoToMeeting that is um, provided by the World Re Worldwide Radio Operators Foundation. So there's a, a charity, a group, of, a nonprofit here in the United States that's dedicated to helping contesting, and uh, they take contributions.